Welcome colleagues and thank you for joining this first regional Asia Pacific dialogue on scaling up locally led adaptation. And my name is Orko Senaroy and I work for the Asian Development Bank as a principal climate change adaptation specialist and I'm very happy to join this discussion and moderate today's dialogue. This dialogue is a part of a series of dialogue being organized across Asia, Africa and Latin America and the Caribbean region to discuss scaling up of locally led adaptation. This Asia Pacific dialogue in particular is being hosted by the International Center for Climate Change and Development, International Institute for Environment and Development, Save the Children and World Resources Institute. Today in this dialogue, we will discuss what does locally led adaptation look in practice? We will hear examples from state and non-state actors of successful examples and delivery mechanisms of locally led adaptation, which means mechanisms that have allowed financing and decision-making to reach the communities at the front line of the climate crisis. We'll also discuss possible ways of scaling up or replicating such successful mechanisms. This dialogue will feed into a second dialogue, which will happen in October this year, and where we will take for the discussion to identify initiatives and organizations that are critical for scaling up and replicating such dialogues. The dialogue should not be seen as an end in itself. It's very much a process to engage all of us in a journey to really set the vision for what local adaptation would look in practice to be implemented at scale, a venue for us to learn from our peers and facilitate learning in that part, and more importantly, to influence donors and partners, specifically financing partners who could play a critical role in the future to really help scale up such successful initiatives, which you know, embraces the principles of locally led adaptation. Next slide, please. Uh, before we dive into the agenda, a couple of um, housekeeping rules. The session is being recorded. We would request you to be all on mute unless you're speaking. Um, all the presentations will be in English, except the case study from Indonesia, which will be in Bahasa, but closed captioning translations will be available in your chat box. Next slide. In terms of the agenda, we will start with a brief introductory session with distinguished speakers highlighting the importance of locally led adaptation. We'll have a brief presentation to discuss the global movement on locally led adaptation, followed by four very exciting case studies from Asia and the Pacific region. In the spirit of being dialogue, we will encourage all of you to participate actively by providing your comments, suggestions, and inputs in the chat box, and also to engage in the Mentimeter poll, which we'll explain later on. We expect to have some time available at the end of the presentations for an open question and hour session. We look forward for your active participation, and without further ado, let me invite Ms. Nicola Pollitt, British Ambassador to Nepal, for providing your introductory remarks. Ms. Pollitt, over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great to be here with you all this morning. Um, good morning to everyone. Uh, it, it's really a great pleasure to be speaking today at the second of these regional dialogues on locally led adaptation. I'm the British Ambassador to Nepal, and I also chair um, the support group for the regional organization ISIMOD, which focuses much of its work on identifying local adaptation solutions for mountain communities in the highly vulnerable Hindu Kush Himalaya. We've known for a long time that local knowledge and solutions are essential for successful adaptation. And enabling inclusive, locally led adaptation is a critical part of what we as COP presidency are seeking to catalyze and continue through the African presidency at COP27. In South Asia, where at least 40 million people are at direct risk of being forced back into poverty by climate change, community level responses to climate risk are autonomous, 
directed by local leaders, indigenous people and women and girls, as they are often the first to experience climate change impacts on their health, on their food supply and water and livelihoods. So principles for locally led adaptation can provide a framework for how adaptation can be delivered more effectively to those most affected. We must work together to determine how we integrate these principles into our decision making and implementation processes so that marginalized people and communities as the key agents of change are empowered to plan for and protect their own future and finance is accessible to those who need it most. All sectors of society, including local and national government, businesses and civil society, multilateral development banks and climate funds must work together to share knowledge and support progress at all levels. In supporting the LDC initiative for effective adaptation and resilience program, the UK recognizes that countries and local communities are the experts in forming the decisions on how to prepare for climate change in their own context. That's why in Nepal, the UK is working with local communities and government to scale up local level support. And where Nepal's NDC has committed to scale up through integrated local adaptation plans of actions, the ILAPA approach, into all 753 of Nepal's local governments. Allocating funds on the basis of community vulnerability to build flood defences, climate proof water schemes and increase investment in climate smart agriculture. The ILAPA approach is based on learning from projects such as the Anukalan project in Nepal. That mobilised investment in climate smart technologies in rural Nepal, such as drip irrigation and conservation agriculture to build the resilience of communities to drought and disease attacks that climate change has made more frequent. This approach shares similarities with the community adaptation work in India, which you'll hear about later, but shows that local innovations can be scaled up to provide national solutions if finance is available at scale. With Fiji and other partners, the UK presidency launched the task force, task force on access to climate finance to align support behind national climate plans to improve local level access to financial flows. And we're also encouraging the research community to respond to local needs. For example, the Adaptation Research Alliance is focusing on action oriented research collaboration between the Southern led local universities and research institutions. In making locally led adaptation a central priority for COP26, we want to amplify the cause for greater support for locally led action and remove the barriers that restrict and prevent finance flowing to the local level. That's why we are working with other countries in the Adaptation Action Coalition. The AAC is focused on accelerating adaptation action in 12 climate vulnerable sectors and promoting, promoting locally led solutions and principles to adaptation support. I'm glad to say that Nepal just yesterday joined the Secretariat of the AAC to share its experience and support the call for increased action on adaptation globally. With the UK holding the COP26 presidency, we want to carry momentum into the African COP27 presidency with adaptation and loss and damage a priority for developing and developed countries alike. I look forward to hearing the outputs of what I'm sure will be a rich conversation and I continue to, and continue to work together to take collective action to scale up finance for community-led adaptation at COP26 and beyond. Thank you. I wish you a good discussion today. Thank you, Ms. Pollitt, so much for sharing your insight, but also for really thanks to government of UK for championing the local-led adaptation framework. And as you mentioned, making it a heart of the discussion at COP26 adaptation and resilience theme but also uh, ensuring the finance theme continues this discussion in the context of devolution of climate finance and finance really reaching the most vulnerable and needed population. Um, it was great to hear about the work that the UK is supporting in Nepal in the context of wider decentralization and locally led adaptation. 
but also the work you're supporting through the wider research community itself, which is a critical aspect to build the evidence for, for ensuring uh, this higher political will and finance goes for such measures. So thanks a lot for that. And so we look forward to continuing working with UK in taking this movement forward. Um, thank you. Um, and we also have with us a shared message from Mr. Sonam Wangdi, the chair of LDC Group and the secretary of National Environmental Commission of the Royal Government of Bhutan, who has kindly shared with us a recorded message. I'll request my colleagues from IIAD to show the, share the message now. Thank you. Greetings uh, from the Kingdom of Bhutan. Hello, everybody, Excellencies, distinguished participants. As the chair of the Elite Developed Countries Group in Climate Negotiations, it is my pleasure to be wel welcoming you to this important discussion on scaling up locally led adaptation. Ben, Let me begin by can... thanking the Adaptation yeah. Action Coalition the UN high-level champions Hi, sorry, and the race to resonance from properly. presenting these dialogues on the Jen, road. We can hear the audio yes. perfectly, but the video I also is, acknowledge um, is not showing for us. Um, Jen, we could hear the, the audio perfectly, but the video was um, not, not showing for participants. I'm not sure if, if we could start that again. Apologies about that. Yeah, let me start that again. Amazing. Thank you. Sorry about that. That's perfect, Jen. Greetings uh, from the Kingdom of Bhutan. Hello, everybody, Excellencies, distinguished participants. As the chair of the least developed countries group in climate negotiations, it is my pleasure to be wel welcoming you to this important discussion on scaling up locally led adaptation. Let me begin by thanking the Adaptation Action Coalition, the UN high level champions and the Race to Resilience for presenting these dialogues on the road to COP26. I also acknowledge the organizations involved in delivering today's dialogue in the Asia-Pacific region, being the International Center for Climate Change and Development, the International Institute for Environment and Development, Save the Children, and the World Resources Institute. And I <clears throat> warmly welcome all our speakers and case study presenters who are part of today's discussion. All around the world, people, communities, and countries are dealing with multiple shocks from climate change, loss of nature, and COVID-19 related impacts. No one is immune from these crises, but the 46 least developed countries who I represent in climate negotiations are certainly among the worst hit by these impacts. Our populations are particularly vulnerable and disproportionately impacted. So when these crises hit our shores, they hit us hard. Both climate change, the loss of nature and COVID-19 are exacerbating existing challenges, setting back sustainable development efforts we recognize that business as usual approaches to deal with the climate crisis are not working in our countries. Already, even at just one degree Celsius of warming, the, the impacts are devastating. If we cannot limit warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius, as agreed in Paris, the impacts will rapidly increase. I've said this countless times, but I would like to stress again that adaptation is critical for us our priority is to improve our ability to adapt to the effects of climate change and build resilience to climate shocks. For this, there is a need to scale up adaptation finance for developing countries to meet <coughs> the needs of the most vulnerable. We, are also, we also need to build our local and international capacity to strengthen our local and traditional knowledge and technology to adapt to the adverse impacts of climate change. However, less than 10% of finance from global climate funds are dedicated to local action. This is unacceptable. 
those in the poorest countries on the front line of climate change are not receiving the support they need to survive. If this continues, we will fail to address the climate crisis. Clearly, things need to change. More financial resources are needed for local government, communities, enterprises, and actors working at local level to implement their own climate solutions. To tackle these challenges, the LDC Group have stepped forward. We launched our long-term 2050 vision at UN Climate Action Summit in 2019. This vision is for LDCs to be on climate resilient development pathways by 2030 and deliver net zero emissions by 2050 to ensure our societies, ecosystems and economies thrive. Our vision is not an empty statement. LDC-led initiatives are already delivering on this vision. For example, the LDC Initiative on Adaptation and Resilience, Life AR, aims for 70% of climate finance to reach the local level by 2030. Distinguished participants, despite being the poorest and most vulnerable, the LDCs came forward to set ambitious targets to fight climate change, even though these burdens should not fall on our shoulders as we are least responsible. We also call on international community, including donors, civil society, climate funds, and the private sector, and all of us here today to follow our lead. You will hear more about the principles for locally-led adaptation shortly, and I'm inspired by the momentum they are generating. These principles, including the focus on increasing resources at local level, providing stable and predictable funding, and investing in local capabilities are a serious and meaningful response to the LDC's ask of the international community in our vision. I urge you to take these principles seriously and to learn from the case studies today that demonstrate these principles in action. I congratulate the more than 40 organizations and governments that have signed up to the principles already. Now is the time to scale up locally-led efforts to support adaptation and resilience. This is a critical element for our society when shocks hit. As we get closer to COP26, I encourage everyone to use the principles as a way to inspire and improve practices in our organizations to enable local action led by the most vulnerable communities. This change is hard, but it is worth it for a brighter and better future. I wish you all fruitful discussions today, and I look forward to seeing the outcomes. Thank you, and Tash Dilek. Thank you, Mr. Wangdi, for your very encouraging words and really uh, setting the stage for today's dialogue. I mean, we are very much aware that the LDC group has been championing this work on local led adaptation by setting their long-term vision and clearly articulating the need to move beyond business as usual way of delivering you know, projects and programs on the ground. And unless we really make that shift, we cannot expect finance to also flow to the local level. We also heard from Mr. Wangli the call for all partners and development financial institutions to jointly you know, embrace these principles and support it in, as, as we move towards the COP26 uh, objectives. So with this, um, I think it's a good time for us to maybe have a little bit of understanding about the participants, uh, who the participants are, where they are joining from, from what type of organizations they're coming from and how they're engaged in the local adaptation principles. So I will request my colleague Aditya Bahadur from IIED to walk you through the Mentimeter questions. Aditya, over to you, please. Thank you very much, Olgo. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Aditya, and I work at the International Institute for Environment and Development. I'm delighted to be supporting the team today with this wonderful dialogue. Uh, we have 110 or so people uh, that have joined us today, a fantastic turnout. Uh, we're really... Um, Really glad all of you are here to learn and engage with us on this vitally important theme. In order to get to know each other a little bit better, we have um, pulled together a Mentimeter poll. 
and you can see the ways to log in on the slide on the screen. And I've just put in the details in the chat box as well. Do log on and we're asking you to answer five simple questions. Tell us where you're connecting from, um, which sector you work in, what are the issues that you work on related to climate change? Have you heard about the principles of locally led adaptation before? And what is your level of experience in operationalizing and actioning locally led adaptation? I'll give you a couple of minutes and then I'll share my screen uh, so that we can see how the results are panning out. If you have any questions, just type them in the chat box and let me know. Um, and if you have any problems in logging on to Mentimeter, do let me know. Although I can see that uh, people have already logged on and we're getting lots of exciting answers to the questions. I will uh, share my screen now. Um, So here we have people answering question number one, Philippines, Bangladesh, Bhutan seem to be emerging as the top destinations from which people have joined us today. Um, of course, delighted to have a representative from Micronesia, Cambodia, uh, even Korea. We have a couple of really sleepy participants um, from the United Kingdom. Um, some, some from the United States, um, really dedicated to the cause of locally led adaptation. We're delighted to have you join us today. Aha, the Indian contingent seems to be growing bigger as time goes by. Let's see what some of the other, um, let's see what some of the other answers are. Lots of interesting answers here. Most people working on climate resilience, climate adaptation, um, some working on renewable energy, forestry. I presume one participant has put down transformative adaptation. Um, I'd love to hear more about that at some point. Uh, we have some participants working on disability and inclusion. Um, some from academia. A big, big representation from researchers. Fantastic to see that. Some from government. And here is other issues that people work on. Climate finance and adaptation planning. Um, comes out as the biggest set. I hope that's not because those are the most inclusive um, broad terms that have a number of um, actions included within them. Some really interesting uh, uh, idea uh, examples right at the outside. People working on the impact of sea level rise, coastal conservation, even some working on issues of sexual health. Really interesting to know how that intersects with climate risk. Um, some working on nature-based solutions, on urban problems, on progress with the SDGs, plastic pollution, vitally important issue underrepresented, underrepresented in adaptation um, discussions, water and climate change. Aha. Gratifying to see that most people have heard of the principles of, for locally led adaptation about which we're going to learn a bit more in a minute. Uh, particularly important for the few of us who spoke to a number of you to help consolidate these principles. So it's fantastic that they're getting out and people are engaging with them. Um, although you'll stop me right when you need to get back to the session. Sure, maybe after this question. Sure, uh, that looks like a great mix to me. Um, a lot of people with 
experience to share uh, um, with others, a lot here to learn from others, um, some very senior experienced people, some slightly more junior, so a, a right mix of people to make for an exciting dialogue. Let's just revisit um, some of the initial slides very quickly, if Olga will permit me, just to see if the, uh, if the answers have changed. You can see broad similarity in what we saw earlier, India, Bangladesh, uh, Nepal, Philippines still dominating. Good to see Sri Lanka and Bhutan coming up as well. Warm welcome to our colleagues from there. Ah, and we have a colleague from Papua New Guinea, from Japan, even from Ecuador. Wow, that's fantastic. Um, great. And then let's look at the next question before I hand back to Olgo in a minute. Climate finance, resilience, adaptation uh, tend to dominate. Um, most people work on adaptation planning, climate finance issues. EBA seems to have become bigger over the last um, couple of minutes. Some colleagues probably have joined us uh, who work on that aspect. Great. Um, almost twice as many people have heard of the principles um, as compared to those who have not. Uh, but hopefully that number will go down now since Surajana is going to talk to us in detail about the principles in a minute. And finally, yes, the right mix of people continues with the level of experience. Really interesting insights. Orgo, what stands out to you um, on, on what you've seen here and back to you for the rest of the session. Thank you, Aditya. I think it's very exciting to see colleagues joining from, you know, from a range of countries from the Pacific, Asia, Europe, US, et cetera, which is very exciting. And also a range of topics that they are working on and all of them are important from adaptations point of view. So without further delay, we'll uh, move on to the next session where I'll request my colleague Saranjana Gupta, who is an advisor on community resilience from the Wairu Commission to introduce the locally led adaptation principles and really have a discussion on why it's a kind of global movement if we are to deliver locally led adaptation at scale. So over to you, Saranjana. Hi, Orko. Thanks very much. Can you hear me? Um, yes, thanks can you. also. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Suranjana, and I'm from the Wairo Commission, which is a global movement focused on empowering grassroots women and their organizations to drive resilient development, which is both pro-poor and more gender equal and gender equitable. So um, let me uh, go to the task at hand, which is that sharing with you some background and context on what is this global effort to build momentum around the idea of locally led adaptation and why are we engaged in amplifying the lessons that are coming out of the practices linked to locally led adaptation. And thanks very much to Marek and his team at IID for creating these lovely slides. So the locally led adaptation is essentially focused on individual households, communities, and local organizations that and, and giving them agency, or perhaps I'd use the word power over their own adaptation processes so that they are able to determine and prioritize and design initiatives that advance their resilience to climate change. And the local actors or institutions that you'll be hearing more about who are actually taking this work forward could be civil society organizations, public or government institutions, or private institutions linked to markets, which include enterprises and small businesses and, um, and micro enterprises, companies, cooperatives, and so on. Why are we talking about locally led adaptation? Well, in the context of the various crises that the world faces today, whether it's the climate crisis, the issues of biodiversity, the issues of inequality and marginalization, it's actually the poor and the marginalized communities living at local level who have to bear the brunt of this. And we know also from some very interesting research done by, I think, Paul Steele and Iskandar Sheikh, if I'm not mistaken, that the it, despite the 
international climate finance and the, the kind of money that governments are spending from their climate finance budgets is actually poor households at the local level who are spending from their own money to address climate change issues and build their uh, and cope with these issues. Um, we, we know from the research done by IIED that a very tiny minuscule percentage of climate global climate finance flows is actually going down to the local level. And we know also that the humanitarian grand bargain has failed to bring humanitarian funding streams down to the local level in the way that they had wanted to. And similarly, development funding also a very small amount reaches the local level. In addition to the problem of small amounts of finance reaching the local level or the quantity of finance is also an issue of quality. So we find that most climate finance that and particularly climate finance that goes to the local level is highly intermediated. There's, there's no uh, investment in or not enough investment in building local capacities. There's too little focus on going to the root causes that allow vulnerabilities to persist. It's the design of, of the finance and the programs that come with it are often top down. They are designed uh, far away from, from the local realities and therefore are not aligned with the local needs and priorities of communities who are bearing the worst effects of climate change. Um, so there is now a growing political commitment to the uh, principles for locally led adaptation. Um, it began with the Global Commission on Adaptation. And there you can see the two commissioners, Sheila Patel of Slum Dwellers International and uh, Dr. Mohammed Musa from BRAC International, who were the commissioners who championed the cause of the locally led adaptation and um, ensured that it was made into its own action track by the Global Commission on Adaptation. And so, and uh, you already heard Mr. Sonam Wangbi, who is the chair of the LDC group, talk about the commitment of the LDC group and its vision to deliver 70% of all climate finance to the local level by the year 2030. In addition, you have the COP26 president, Alok Sharma, who stressed that the locally led adaptation principles are going to be uh, uh, an important part of the adaptation and loss and damage uh, discussions at the COP26. You have the Adaptation Action Coalition working in partnership with Egypt, Bangladesh, Malawi, Netherlands, and St. Lucia to link the, the locally led adaptation principles to their work, the race for resilience, which is also looking to champion the principles for locally led adaptation and the vulnerable countries that are asking for more direct access through empowerment oriented pathways. And the next slide shows you the over 55, sorry, uh, endorsements from different institutions and organizations, including uh, multilaterals, bilaterals, social movements, such as the Viro Commission and the uh, Slum Dwellers International, who have signed up or uh, adopted the, the, endorsed the principles for locally led adaptation. And the most important thing I think about this, these endorsements are that there is a willingness to work together and figure out how these locally led adaptation principles can be implemented and can be scaled up by working collectively and collaborating to advance the solutions that will actually work on the ground for poor and marginalized communities. But many of you have already heard of and know about the principles for locally led adaptation. And remember that these principles provide us with direction and guidance on the actions that need to be implemented. So the, let me just quickly go through the eight principles with you. The first one focuses on devolving 
decision making to the lowest level possible, the lowest appropriate level. So we know that problems uh, need to be solved often by, uh, by local people and local institutions that are close to them. Uh, this doesn't mean that we believe that only local action is needed, but we think that local action is incredibly important to drive and set the agendas what, uh, for what is done at higher levels. The second principle focuses on addressing structural inequalities. The locally led adaptation principles look at how we need to go to the root causes of vulnerability, the, the, the poverty, the deprivation, the environmental erosion, all of which are exacerbating existing problems and allowing vulnerability to persist. So we need to look at those as well as the immediate causes of uh, vulnerability. Um, the third uh, principle focuses on providing patient predictable funding that can be accessed more easily. I think all of you understand this, that we need money that is easily accessible at the local level, and we need to look at steady flows of money over long uh, time frames so that people can test and produce effective results rather than looking for quick fixes. Then we have the fourth principle, which focuses on investing in local capabilities and capacities. Rather than looking constantly at bringing in external support, we have to invest in building and strengthening local institutions so that they can actually effectively face the impacts of climate change. We have uh, the fifth principle that focuses on building a robust understanding of climate risks and, and dealing with uncertainties. The, the sixth principle focuses on building flexible programming and learning. This is my personal favorite because we need institutions, organizations, the technical capacities and the financial resources that can quickly shift and act in response to continually changing circumstances, which means we have to quickly learn, adapt and act um, and, and, and develop very agile systems and strategies to deal with changing circumstances. And uh, the seventh principle focuses on ensuring transparency and accountability. I think you all understand the fact that today all our systems for transparency and accountability are focused upward on donors from and from whom we receive money, but we have very little accountability to the local level where we are supposed to deliver real impact. And finally, there's the idea that no institutions can do this on its own. This is a huge challenge and institutions need to collaborate to bring together their diverse capacities and networks so that we can actually build solutions together that work for all of society. So with that, I will quickly um, tell you what today's dialogues are focusing on. We're actually going to hear a little bit about what IED calls the delivery mechanisms that are already in place. The idea is to show people what the locally led adaptation principles actually look like when we implement them. What do, what do they look like in practice? And we're going to hear from a number of uh, case studies how these, how, how, uh, how local institutions or delivery mechanisms uh, have been created to actually deliver resources and decision-making on the ground to local communities and local institutions. And this is part of a larger series of dialogues you can see. And the goal here is to help us understand the implementation of locally led adaptation principles, as well as look at the big challenge of how do we scale up this, these principles? How do we build a strong evidence base which can be used to advocate with policymakers for greater financial, technical, and policy support 
that is better aligned to the needs of local institutions, local communities, and local governments. And finally, you can see on the last slide that IID and WRI are collecting a series of case studies from all over the world where we're trying to show that it is actually possible to implement and scale up locally led adaptation and several countries, several governments and civil society organizations are already doing this work. This work is already underway. It's already at some scale and there's investment behind these things. We're going to learn more about these things and we'll have an opportunity to analyze this more carefully. So uh, with that, let me just check in uh, with Aisha Dinshaw of WRI, who is one of the organizers, to check if I've missed out anything. And if not, we can go to the next set of questions, which you can just put into the chat box. Thank you so much, Suresh. Oh. That was wonderful. Um, we have one question that I wonder if you want to speak to. It's about principle six. Um, and the question is, do you feel people really understand this principle and what is needed? Um, and the fact that what is needed may be very different from what we have been doing in the past. Wow, it's a, it's a great question. And uh, personally, I think that we can only understand these questions, these, uh, you know, what is needed um, in terms of flexibility of programming when we see it at work. So when I see what women's groups in the Wiro network have done during the COVID crisis in the sense that they were, they, were, they haven't Many of them have not been working on issues of health. They, they have been working on issues of climate resilience and investing in climate smart agriculture, for example. So they were able to quickly mobilize themselves, organize, identify where the most vulnerable households were, look at how they could deliver information, resources. They quickly uh, uh, um, ensured that their, their pools of group funds or savings or any funds they had access to, like the Community Resilience Fund, could be used to deliver uh, whatever communities need, whether it was food or other essentials, could be delivered to communities and the most vulnerable households. So, for me, that represents a certain kind of agility and flexibility where you're taking whatever resources are at your disposal to quickly shift them to function in a way that supports a different kind of crisis. But um, I think that, that it also means it, we are also assuming that the flexibility um, requires groups to have money, to have information, to have relationships, their own networks, relationships with government. So it, it requires flexibility and learning require a number of different factor things to come together to create this larger system that will actually work to deliver quickly to those who are most vulnerable in a crisis. So that's all that I'll say about that. But if there's someone else who'd like to speak on that issue, maybe they can raise their hand or they can just unmute from the organizing team and add anything. Thanks, Rajna. No? Yeah. Was great. We have a couple of other really good points and questions, um, and we have uh, about three or four minutes. So I just wanted to ask a couple of other questions. Um, so one is about the transition to urban living and whether locally led adaptation also covers communities in urban areas, not just rural areas. And then we also have a question about, um, you know, how the principles were generated. Um, were they generated with input from local level stakeholders? So Saranjana, I'll let you answer as much as you'd like and um, Aditya and I are happy to step in as well if you'd like. Okay, I, I mean, 
uh, I think the two, the the I, I would very briefly answer, but then give uh, you guys an opportunity to speak more on this. The, uh, we, uh, I think the there was a there were wide consultations held to create the adaptation principles, and for example. Wairo Commission uh, was one of the networks that was consulted. We contributed to uh, some of the, the, the thinking um, on the adaptation principles, but I know that there were many, many other organizations and people who contributed. And uh, on the issue of urban living, yes, of course, I think adaptation, uh, locally led adaptation also applies very much to urban areas and um, I, uh, I, I think that um, because people's livelihoods often in urban areas are not directly related to nature, natural resources, the, the way is in which people recognize or understand their problems as being linked to climate change are a little more complicated. So with that, let me hand over to the team of Aisha and Aditya to say more on these two questions. I think you're exactly right. Um, we definitely um, feel like the urban areas are as important as rural areas when it comes to locally led adaptation. And um, we, we had a great case study, for instance, showcased in the Africa Dialogue yesterday about urban poor funds. And so, um, you know, one of the things that we'll do following these dialogues is share more about each of these case studies. And you can see the range of, um, you know, who has been doing what on locally led adaptation in different contexts. And with regards to the question about, um, you know, whether these principles were really a bottom-up process, we did, like Sarantana said, make efforts to work through organizations that have real on-the-ground presence um, to make sure that they were reflecting local needs um, and local priorities and were appropriate. I will say that although the principles are, um, you know, they're sort of codified, we do have endorsements, but we are very aware that they need to be a bit of a living document. We've had um, a person in the chat flag um, a rewording that would be preferable. So if you see something that doesn't quite reflect, you know, the your opinion or the community that you represent, we are, you know, very welcome to get that feedback. Um, we are at time for this part of the session, but um, and we do need to move on to the next session, but we are collecting all of the questions in the chat as well as all of the comments, and hopefully we'll be able to come back to them um, during the question and answer session after the presentations. But we want to be able to give the case study presentations um, as much time as possible because they are really wonderful examples of locally led adaptation. So thank you so much, Sarantana. That was wonderful. And we'll hand back to Argo. Thank you, Aisha, and thank you, Saranjana, for an excellent presentation, for introducing the principles, for highlighting the importance of the quality and quantity of climate finance, um, for discussing the political will that is growing among the government and partners, uh, financing partners to support these principles, and most importantly, talking about institutions that have collectively come together and signed up for these principles and have, um, and with, with the objective of working together to, to address these issues. I think it's also important for each one of us working in different types of organizations to see how we can take forward these principles in the context of our own organization and see how we can help our organization move beyond business as usual implementation approaches to really help implement these principles. Um, with this, we will move on to the next session of the, um, of the um, dialogue where the idea is to dive into, uh, next slide please, four specific case studies. Um, Suranjana so showed on the slide the various case studies that have been collected by the organizing team. But over here, we will look into a case study from Micronesia, from Indonesia, from Bangladesh, and from India. And we discuss how these case studies um, have looked into specific delivery mechanism that Suranjana explained in terms of ensuring the local adaptation principles are meeting their objectives. So as we go on with the first speaker, I would like to highlight, next slide, that the Mentimeter is very much open and we would request all of you to actively participate in the Mentimeter and try and answer these two questions. One is 
are you aware of other delivery mechanisms that can help you know take forward climate finance and facilitate local adaptation following the principles uh, that were presented recently and these delivery mechanisms could be across state or non-state actors or any part in the world and secondly what according to you should climate finance organizations or big intermediaries like bilateral donors multilateral development banks un agencies international ngos can do to deliver more climate finance through these delivery mechanisms. It'd be very useful for us to hear from all of you. So please do uh, actively participate in the Mentimeter while we go on to hear from each of the four case studies. So the first case study is from Bangladesh, from the Climate Bridge Fund. I'm gonna request Ms. Anandita Ridita, who is the manager of operations of the Climate Bridge Fund to make the presentation on behalf of Dr. Golam Rabani, who's the head of the Climate Bridge Fund Secretariat at BRAC. And then the floor is yours. You have eight minutes for the presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Arthur. Just give me a second to uh, share my presentation. I hope that my slide is visible to everyone now. Yes, we can see it. Thank you. Thank you, Arthur. So hello everyone, I'm Anindita Rudita and I'm working with uh, Climate Bridge Fund Secretariat as the Manager of Operations. And today I will be briefly sharing the mechanism of the Climate Bridge Fund and also some of our learning so far. I will start with the background and some of the key information about the fund. So the discussions and efforts started back in 2015 between BRAC and KFW to establish a sustainable trust fund. It took around four years to put the thoughts into papers Finally, CBF was established on November 2019. CBF is an innovative, first of its kind in the non-government sector of Bangladesh, a direct fi uh, climate finance mechanism. We support only the registered NGOs of Bangladesh to address the climate-induced migration-related problems and challenges. Our three priority areas are, are among the climate hotspots of Bangladesh. We are currently covering five cities including three city corporations and two municipality areas of Bangladesh. We have a diverse stakeholders engaged with Climate Bridge Fund in different capacities, which include both government and non-government stakeholders and also the communities. We have a flexibility to fund a wide range of sectoral projects, but our key priorities include water, sanitation and hygiene, livelihood support, health support, housing related support, food security and so on. In this slide, you can see the approaches that we follow or the features of Climate Bridge Fund awarded projects. First up, we have local ownership. And we always promote local ownership as projects are developed in consultation with local government institutes. And we always follow and honor their plans and policies. The next up, we have bottom-up approach. Anita, Anita, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry to interrupt. Um, we're getting some chats that it's a little hard to hear you. So if we could just ask you okay. to um, move a little closer to them. Thank you. Right. Is it better now? Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. So the next approach that we have is bottom-up approach. And to ensure that communities uh, are consulted during project development, our projects are mostly community-led. So their needs and priorities are continuously um, you know, collected from the field and reflected adequately throughout the project cycle. Next, we have innovative practice. And we always promote innovative but context-specific effective ideas. Then gender inclusion is a major criteria for all our projects. And we also focus on bridging short term to sustainable model as we fund three to five years long projects. Then last we have knowledge and evidence. One of our key focuses is to create good examples through our projects and share the knowledge and learning with uh, external stakeholders. So how CBF is unique? Well, we believe that it is in many ways, though we have only passed one and a half years and still long way to go, but some of our mechanisms and approaches that proved to be successful so far, which gave us the confidence to call it so. And we would love to hear from you about your thoughts as well. So we look, um, if we look through the lens of the eight principles for locally led adaptation to see where CBF stands. So first of all, 
as mentioned earlier, that we promote local, uh, local decision-making process by consulting both communities and local government institutes from the very beginning of the projects. So the need and priorities of the field is always collected and reflected in the project cycle. Then our main target group is climate migrants, as I have already mentioned, but we also include other excluded groups such as women, youth, displaced people, etc. Next up, our funding mechanism is very quick as it takes around six months from proposal submission to the first disbursement, according to our operation manual. And we try to support the local NGOs to ensure uh, their funding security. In case of the international INGOs, who, if they are the applicant, then we encourage partnership with local NGOs. CBF projects implement through the community-based committees, as I have already mentioned, that their capacity building of community is one of our inbuilt mechanisms for all the projects. Then we have building a robust understanding of climate risk and uncertainty. We do not only focus on the skill development in the community, but also on their knowledge enhancement on climate risks, so that they have a clear and better understanding of the problem. Then we follow a very flexible programming method as we are um, new and we constantly learn and adapt new effective measures throughout our project cycle. Then transparency and accountability. So it is very important for us and I would like to give you a quick uh, idea about how we ensure that in the evaluation process. So Climate Bridge Fund Secretariat, they basically evaluate the proposals and prepare the evaluation report which they eventually present to the advisory committee. The advisory committee members are mainly different experts in the sector and also we have three representatives from different relevant government offices. Then the secretary has no objection from KFW on the recommendation of the advisory committee. Finally, the trustee board, which is chaired by the executive director of BRAC, takes the final decision based on the recommendation of the advisory committee and no objection from KFW. So all the information are always shared with the management committees very transparently, and we are always accountable to them. Um, I can hear you. Um, Anelita, could you unmute yourself, please? I think we lost Anandita. Maybe we just wait for a minute to see if she's able to rejoin. Hello, Arka. Can I? Uh, can yes, we can now? hear you now. Please go ahead. Sorry, sorry, sorry my please. electricity was gone. And hmm. sorry, sorry for that. Please go ahead. Okay, thank you so much. So the journey of CBF. To summarize our journey, I would like to say that our journey includes ensuring an institutionally led process. So Climate Bridge Fund, as you already know, has been institutionalized through BRAC and KHW, and we follow all the policies of BRAC. CBF also honors uh, the policies and plans of the local government institutes and uphold those during their project designing. Then partnership is one of our strongest suit of um, Climate Bridge Fund functionality and governance from the very beginning, as it is established on the successful partnership between KFW and BRAC. Then in order to operationalize the secretariat, we had a series of meetings with the government offices and their suggestions always helped us. Also, we have launched three calls so far and completed two batch of evaluation already. And our uh, evaluation process is quite long and rigorous, but this process itself enhanced our skills and knowledge about the reality and facts of the fields. And last up, our journey includes challenges. As you know, that there are always challenges in trying out something new. 
One of the main challenges were COVID-19 pandemic, the 2020 evaluation process and the project implementation, everything were badly affected by the series of the lockdowns and movement restrictions throughout the country. But we tried to overcome those challenges by adapting new measures and modalities of working. Then another challenge that we faced is that while the fund was established, there was around 10% tax on the investment amount, which is now uh, increased up to 30% under the new law. So CBF is trying to find a way out through um, the support of the BRAC management and government representatives. So that is an ongoing process for us now. And that brings us to my last slide, which is the recommendation to the task force. And we have two recommendations, which um, we think are very important. The first is that project selection and disbursement process should be quick and easy. The reason we say that is because during our consultation with city authorities and the communities, we came to know about the huge needs of climate migrants. Now, if the gap between the proposal submission and the funding is long, then the context changes and so that the needs. So it should be quick and easy. So another uh, recommendation from us is that during our evaluation process, we found out that local NGOs often fall behind in the competitive process of funding uh, for local, um, you know, a competitive process of securing funding. So we really think that they need to be capacitated as they directly work in the fields and they have better idea about the field realities. So allocating a separate budget for their capacity building will be really helpful in the long run. So that's the end of my presentation. Thank you so much for listening. If you have any question, I will try my best to answer. I would like to hand over to Orko for uh, facilitating that part. Thank you. Thank you, Anandita, so much for sharing the um, experience of the Climate Bridge Fund, which I think is extremely innovative, but also very forward looking because it looks at some of the evolving issues like climate induced migration, which is a big problem in, in Bangladesh. As you can see, the participants are really excited, a lot of questions for you. So in interest of time, I'll request you to perhaps try and answer some of the questions in the chat box, if that's okay with you. But if I can just briefly ask one simple question, we heard about the principles from Saranjana earlier. Now, in terms of the Climate Bridge Fund, what are some of the challenges you think you will face in terms of implementing the fund in the context of those principles? Are there specific principles which you think are more challenging for you to implement? And if so, how you're trying to overcome? And any quick, quick response on that? Okay, thank you, Arvo. Uh, one of the first thing that uh, we have you know, faced as a challenge that I would say is that uh, when a local organizations submit their proposals for climate adaptation measures, uh, they often lack the knowledge or the capacity to differentiate between a regular development project and a climate adaptation uh, major focus project. So we often struggle to uh, evaluate those or score those because there is this huge gap and we have this process of, you know, um, continuously um, talking to them or making them understand the differences during our NGO um, briefing sessions and and different other sessions for their capacity development. So as I have already mentioned that if they have the basic ideas about what a climate adaptation major focused project should look like, then it would be you know, good for us to get good projects and also to, uh, it will be a very competitive process. And in the long run, the people who are in the climate <laughs> migrants will be benefited. So that is one challenge that we are facing currently. Thank you so much, Ainda, for highlighting this challenge. We look forward to continue engaging with the Climate Bridge Fund. But meanwhile, I will also request you if you are able to answer some of the questions on the chat box. Uh, with this, we'll move on to the second presentation. But I do want to remind the participants that the Mentimeter is open. So please do go ahead and contribute to the two questions that was posed earlier. The second presentation will be made by Tamara Alefayo from the Micronesia Conservation Trust. Uh, Tamara, the floor is yours. And you have eight minutes for the presentation, please. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm just gonna um, share my screen. Um, and while I'm doing that, I just wanna say um, that, that having made Micronesia my home for, for the last 20 years, I'm obviously not from there, 
Um, but I'm very honored right now and very privileged to um, be here and be able to share the, the lessons and, and the knowledge that I've been gifted uh, throughout my time in the region. Um, is my screen okay now? I hope everybody yes, can see it. it. Okay, yeah. perfect. All right. So I'm Tamara uh, with the Micronesia Conservation Trust. I am here on behalf of Willie Kostika, our executive director. Um, he's unfortunately unable to be here today. Um, so a little bit about the Micronesia Conservation Trust. So we're a, a private non-government non organization, um, a non-profit corporation. Um, our mission is to provide sustainable financing and support for biodiversity conservation, sustainable development, and environmental education, as well as livelihoods. Um, we are based in the Federated States of Micronesia. If you think about the wide open Pacific Ocean, um, oh, sorry, I think you can't see me there, is that better? If you think about, about the Pacific Ocean and you think about Hawaii and then you think about Japan, we, we service the, the area in between. So it's the Federated States of Micronesia, um, the Republic of Palau, the Republic of the Marshall Islands, and then two U.S. territories, the U.S. territory of Guam and then the Commonwealth of the Northern Marianas. These five entities or jurisdictions also make up the, um, uh, the context of, of, or sorry, the membership of what's called the Micronesia Challenge. And the Micronesia Challenge was a commitment by the chief executives and the presidents of those five jurisdictions and countries uh, to effectively conserve and manage 50% of their marine resources and 30% of their terrestrial resources by 2030. But they need funding to be able to do that. When you close off an area for effective conservation, it means that you have, um, you might be contributing to, to you know, climate adaptation and conservation, but you have a serious gap in livelihoods and communities are affected. So we all, we work in that area. Um, we mobilize funding from a diversity of sources and we provide long-term sustained funding. I heard through the last two presentations um, a lot about the need for long-term funding uh, as opposed to one-offs and MCT works very hard to, to, to provide that. We're also, um, sorry if I may, from my, um, yeah, so our, our impact areas are, are conservation, sustainable livelihoods, and climate resilience. And we partner with a wide range of organizations, so local community organizations, women's groups, community organizations, state governments, national governments, um, church groups, any community group that is, is prepared and, and willing to um, implement a project um, on, on behalf of their, their, their needs, their management needs. Um, so MCT's journey, um, we were established in 2002 by um, Mr. William Kostika, our, our executive director, um, and we were established in order to, to um, be able to provide funding to communities, but also to, to house what, what he saw as an important aspect of, which was an endowment. So if you look at this, this um, to the right, this, these, fact, these figures were taken from our, um, or, sorry, I'm seeing that someone wants me to speak slowly. My apologies, I'll try to be slower. Um, in 2019, these are our, our figures. So in that, in 2019, we subgranted or we funded approximately $1.6 million across the region in small projects to communities. Um, but we also hold an endowment. So we have um, an endowment, Current this says 23 million, but it's actually currently worth $25 million. And this endowment are contributions from government entities and also some donors. And we hold it and we invest it. And then we're able to give it back to the, the governments of these five regions in order for them to continue to support communities in their region. Um, we also have, since 2002, we, we've been holding endowments, but we're also um, able to, to receive, a, we've been receiving a lot of funds from private donors, such as the Margaret A. Cargill Foundation, um, the, the uh, car, sorry, the, the um, Weight Institute, and then we have a number of international large donors, so UNEP, UNDP, and a lot of bilateral government funding as well. Um, and we also have, are part of a number of large networks, including GUSPA and others. Um, but I think importantly, one of the things that makes MCT really uh, unique is we are the smallest entity in the world to be um, accredited by both the Adaptation Fund and the Green Climate Fund. So as a pretty small intermediary organization, so far we've received a $1 million grant for our under adaptation fund for the Federated States of Micronesia. Um, and we're currently implementing and supporting that. We also recently received our first um, green climate fund on behalf of the government of the Federated States of Micronesia. Um, and that's a, a SAP project that we will begin to implement. And that's, that, that is um, under the, um, sorry, that, that one is, that is for food security. 
And then we also have an up and coming um, grant that we're working with the GCF that will be with the board soon that will be for the region. Um, and that one is specifically for regional capacity. So I don't think I need to go through this slide. Um, I, 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 we prepared this because this is the experience of MCT, but I think that um, this was already shared quite succinctly. Um, some of the issues faced by local partners to access funding and implement locally led adaptation. So, you know, climate access to climate finance, um, capacity in terms of due diligence and reporting, donor priorities, one-offs versus long-term funding, and then the sustainability. So, we were asked to um, consider MCT in response to the, the principles, the eight principles. And I did see some, some mention in the chat um, about they're great principles, but what do they look like on the ground? So um, I, I just wanna go through how MCT has been addressing these principles. So the first one, um, developing decision-making to the lowest appropriate level. So I think MCT, importantly, we aim to deliver grants to regional, national, local, municipal and NGO actors, as well as, and it doesn't say here, communities and um, church groups and any groups that are, are willing to apply. And we do this mostly through a request for proposals, so a small granting scheme. Um, and we support, we, we not only um, offer funding, but we, we support the communities in a collaborative process to, to develop their proposals. And then importantly, 90% of MCT staff are from Micronesia. I'm one of only two people that's not from the region. Um, and I think that because they're community members and, and, and this, is, this is their home, um, that it's, it's really um, easy to assume that, the, that this is at the lowest appropriate level. Um, number two, addressing structural inequalities. So we're very inclusive and we ensure gender equality and, and, and rural, remote and underserviced communities. Almost all of the communities in Micronesia are either rural, remote or underserviced. Um, we provide a, a predictable funding. So through our small grants to local organizations over long time frames, um, we, we consider it a snowball effect. I think for the Pacific, maybe it's a sandcastle effect, but we fund projects um, and then they'll, we'll fund a project and then we'll have another call for proposals and that community will be able to um, apply for more funding. And we hope we, we, some of our projects, some of our partners have been receiving funding for over 10 years. Um, we invest in local capa capabilities, um, and through that, we have a full capacity building program. So through our capacity building program, we offer financial management training, M&E training, climate change adaptation and planning training, ecosystem conservation. Um, and I think what I'm most excited about at MCT is, is our Bill Rayner Micronesia Challenge Scholarship. So we've funded over 16 graduate and PhD or master's and PhD students from the region, and all of them have come home and they are all working in either government or in local NGOs. Um, I, important to you, what is really important to us is that we fund local knowledge. We fund observational knowledge and, it, and we also fund scientific data. So we fund a lot of research. Um, and then we, we support the you know, scientific monitoring over long time frames. so a science to management model. Um, and as an intermediary, one of the things that's really good is that we're the ones who speak with the larger donors. So we are able to be more flexible um, and we're also able, able to advocate. Um, so when a project is delayed or the, any problems happen, COVID has obviously been a big issue for a number of our partners. We're able to sort of go to bat on their behalf. Um, ensuring transparency and accountability. I think this one is really, really one of the biggest risks. Um, and how we do that is we ensure that the local governments, the civil society and communities are structured right into the project and they're part of the design so that they have ownership. Uh, and we do a lot of monitoring and visiting and capacity building. Um, and then collaborative action and investment. We've been working in the same communities for over 18 years. Um, and like I said, most of, mo most of the team are from the region. Um, and they're known by, and they know of, you know, our partners. So I just want to share, I think what, what, is, what we've learned and to, to be the best mechanism and the best mode of supporting locally led adaptation is, is small grants. So over the past, for instance, five years, we've probably subgranted almost maybe two, two and a half million US dollars into communities. Um, and we support that through a call for proposals, um, local community organizations, local governments. They, and the benefits of this and how this supports locally led adaptation, they identify their own projects, um, their own budgets and their own components. Um, the 
funding is prioritized um, for, for communities that have already developed their own um, uh, plans. So they have their own local um, management plans and we fund the actions under those. Um, we offer a fiscal sponsorship pairing if necessary as well. So we have a number of, of um, partners that can receive the funding from us to them and then can support them. Uh, we offer a lot of capacity and technical support and our grants are small. Um, they're 10 to 50,000 US dollars and we found that 50,000 is about, the, about the, the capacity of most of our small partners. Um, and I think I just wanted to end with a recommendation. So the two most important recommendations I would um, share are with larger donors and, and, and just to consider, and I, these might be a little redundant, but I think that we forget these. Um, trust, we need to trust local entities to know their own context on the ground. And I think another one that I've learned over the course of my time in the Pacific is to remain open. So we need to remain open to what may seem like an unexpected, unexpected or a counterintuitive solution. Um, just because it comes from a community and it might be something outside of the box or some other way of looking at things, um, oftentimes they, they, they tend to be how things start and then we, we end up um, being able to learn from them and then you know, scale them up. And that's it, that's my um, information. Thank you. Thank you, Tamara, so much for sharing this exciting example. I found it very, very intriguing because uh, clearly you've been experiencing a lot of the past 18 years of the fund being there. And I talked about very interesting modalities where you combine different kinds of financial modalities, including revolving funds and endowment fund together. Um, and also you talked about the importance of funding local knowledge and the sandcastle effect, which I think is absolutely critical for the um, you know, local ed principles model itself. Uh, there are a couple of questions I'll request you to answer later on through the chat box, but there's one specific question about how MCT is actually collaborating with the wider Pacific community. Um, and do you have any experiences of that and how that can be further taken forward if the examples from your case? Um, yep, I, we, we are the host organization for GLISPA, the Global Island, um, sorry. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Sorry, I think we lost. Tamara, uh, maybe we give a minute. Okay, in the interest of time, maybe we can move ahead. Um, I'm sure she'll join. So I thought it's the right time for us perhaps to revisit the mental healer. Uh, Aditya, do you just wanna walk us through and see what kind of replies have come there? Sure, um, lots of very interesting responses coming in. I'm just gonna share my screen so you can see um, what people are saying. So on the question about what other delivery mechanisms are you aware of to deliver climate finance to the local level? Um, people giving all kinds of interesting um, examples, talking about biofin. Um, uh, there's repeated emphasis on different kinds of environment-based um, and ecosystem-based DRR-related mechanisms. The GCF enhanced direct access uh, has also come up a few times. Of course, some more expected answers along the lines of established climate funds. Microfinance um, is an interesting addition that I feel needs to be discussed more in the context of locally led adaptation. Uh, glad to see people being paying attention and the Climate Bridge Fund has also been mentioned. Um, so that's great. Um, some trust funds like the Micronesia Conservation Trust, the Caribbean Biodiversity Fund, um, uh, the UNDP GEF Small Grants Program that I know uh, has been accessed by a large number of civil society organizations uh, across the Global South, also being mentioned, really relevant. The UNCDF Local um, uh, Initiative that has been included in previous uh, dialogues and presentations that have been made on locally led adaptation as well. Um, I think the issue of private sector finance comes up again and again. 
Uh, and I think uh, we need to take that on board because at the moment, we feel that it isn't explored uh, as much as it could have in the context of the discourse on locally led adaptation. So that's a very quick bird's eye view on this question, Orgo. I'll go on to the next one, if Mentimeter will allow me. Yes, it has allowed me, thank God. Um, and so then to the question of what could climate finance providers and big intermediaries do to deliver more climate finance to the local level via these delivery mechanisms? A uh, lot of interesting input, um, overall agreement that the, the ethos and principles of LLA are really relevant. It could be used to guide action. People emphasizing the importance of multi-stakeholder participatory approaches. Um, the idea of public-private partnerships has come up a few times to see the manner in which that could support locally-led adaptation. Uh, people have emphasized the importance of community-led and female-led initiatives, particularly. One interesting input on ensuring that fiduciary requirements from people accessing finance, uh, for people accessing finance, are developed in a way that enables local organizations uh, to also participate as opposed to um, the uh, um, automatically privileging international organizations with more robust financial management systems. Um, the importance of building capacity for accessing and managing local, uh, locally led uh, adaptation and finance for locally led adaptation has also come up uh, a few times. Uh, so it's, I mean, this point is important because we shouldn't assume that capacity exists and just developing a new mechanism will lead to people accessing this finance. It needs to be coupled with uh, capacity building initiatives as well. Simplified and faster application processes have been emphasized. This is a point that we've raised in the past as well. Uh, and in our working paper on locally led adaptation that I will ask someone to post a link off in the chat box, please. We've given examples of what these could include. Some um, front runner funds are uh, allowing people to apply for financing through, uh, uh, through video, uh, applying for financing in different languages, as opposed to the traditional long and arduous performers that many local organizations find hard to complete. Um, so, yeah, I think Orgo, that's a very quick overview of the really exciting answers that we're getting to these Ventimeter questions that we will all collate and record um, as we make sense of all the exciting discussions that have taken place um, in, in this dialogue. Back to you. Thank you, Aditya, so much. And very exciting to see these answers. Um, I think it's very important for us to maybe for future dialogues really unpack and see how these different delivery mechanisms are appropriate for funding or financing different types of solutions. Because I would assume that you know, um, different mechanisms are more appropriate for certain kinds of solutions than the other. Um, we'll get back to you, Aditya, at the end of the fourth presentation again to see if there's any update on that. But meanwhile, let's move on to the third presentation, which is from Indonesia, from Yakum Emergency Unit. We have with us Ibu Warsila and Pa David to share with us their uh, work that they're doing with YEU. Uh, this presentation will be in Bahasa, so colleagues, please to look for the closed captioning option at the bottom of your screen uh, to get the English translation. So over to you, colleagues from Yakum Emergency Unit. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Argya. Hi hey everyone, thank you for this opportunity. Uh, we are from Yakum Emergency Unit. Uh, I'm sorry, we have no presentation slide, but first I want to tell you that the National Disaster Management Agency in Indonesia has recorded 1,805 1, disasters during January to August 2021, in which more than 98% were hydrometrical disasters. The risks are even higher when combined with the other challenges such as poverty, gender inequality, environmental degradation, food and water insecurity, and the other disaster. We can rely only on managing disaster. We also need to manage disaster risk. In this case, climate risk through community resilience building. Since 2015, 
Yakum Emergency Unit with the support of the Haurio Commission has assisted more than 60 grassroots women groups in 44 villages to support their local resident action. Women are often seen as vulnerable. In fact, women have local knowledge about their community as they spend more time in their neighborhood. Community access to flexible financial resources like community resident fund, however, is still challenging. Flexibility for us refers to allowing local communities to determine how funds will be best utilized to add fund their resident needs. Typically, when communities gain access to financial resources, these are already made for specific activities. This leaves communities without a voice in determining how to use funds. Investment through community resilient fund was adapted as both a learning tool and flexible funding mechanism. To support communities, urgent needs allowing them to manage the fund on their own. For CRF investment for the women group, the funding granted is $1,000 till $2,000 America for each group, where 50% of them is allocated for capacity building, like risk mapping, peer learning, and others. And 50% is managed to develop their priority action. To manage funding, women group collectively map their risk capacity and priorities that help them to identify resilient action. In this process, they build consensus that lead to collective action. Bookkeeping training has, was helped to help the organization and administrator to control and allocate the funding for group operational, member income, and social data, which is reported to the member every month to keep the fund management transparent and accountable. The contextual and specific action led by grassroots women result in more effective adaptation. The biggest loss due to uncertain climate in pool. So often farmers do not have the capital to continue farming. By managing a growth, resilient fund for climate adaptive agriculture Women group have reduced the impact of the map risk and found the best way to emit to mitigate an unpredictable season for agricultural activity. At the same time, engage closely with the government for data validation and exchange information about one another. Based on the priorities rising from mapping, resilient practice ranging from small scale grocery soap seed bank, waste bank, aquaponic, urban farming, climate adaptive farming, and others were introduced. This local action by grassroots women demonstrate the capacities of women as change maker. Change maker is in this case, meaning that they are, they are able to leverage their role in the community and strengthen their contribution in development and adaptation planning. Indonesia has a decentralization policy or regional, regional autonomy that requires local participants and enable decision making at the regency or local level. But only a few local actors, especially among women, are involved in the planning process and rarely mean, make meaningful contribution that address the vulnerabilities in the Mapping, training, resilient initiative, initiative for learning and dialogue with stakeholders deepen their understanding of organization skills that make them eligible, accountable, and help women gain recognition as leaders who represent local community and influence the adaptation plan. As a result of the initiative, 80% the groups have registered their organization to the village government structure. 90% of the groups have their members serve in the leader's position or be a part of decision maker in the community. Managing action to manage disaster risk and 
successfully participate in the village budgeting plan. The Melati Group is one of the grassroots groups in Indonesia, Yogyakarta, who made significant resilient improvement through initiative using the CRF mechanism. So she is Ibu Warsila, want to tell you when you want to tell you about his activity in Melati Group. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Perkenalkan, nama saya Warsila, Ketua Kelompok Wanita Tani Melati, Dusun Watu Gajah, Giri Jati Purwosari, Gunungjipur. Pada tahun 2019, kelompok kami diaktifkan kembali setelah vakum 10 tahun. Kami didukung oleh YU dan Hairo Commission dan mendapatkan dana ketahanan komunitas. Kami bersyukur karena sejak saat itu, kami jadi tahu tujuan dari organisasi kami dan kekuatan kami sebagai perempuan, sehingga kami punya kesempatan untuk membuat kehidupan menjadi lebih baik lagi. Dengan mengelola dana ketangguhan masyarakat dan menjalani prosesnya, kami sekarang memiliki pengetahuan, informasi, dan kemampuan, sehingga kami dapat menyampaikan ide-ide kami dan terlibat dalam berbagai kegiatan di desa. Kami telah belajar bahwa banyak dan antusias kami telah mengundang banyak dukungan. Kami bekerja sama dengan Balai Penyuluhan Pertanian yang membantu kami untuk meningkatkan kapasitas sebagai petani perempuan, melengkapi dokumen administrasi dan persyaratan pendukung lainnya, yang membuat kami berhasil menerima dukungan dari pemerintah dan berkontribusi pada perencanaan program dinas pertanian melalui aktivitas-aktivitas konsultasi. Sejak melakukan pertanian adaptif iklim, kami menjalin hubungan baik dengan pemerintah desa kami. Terima kasih kepada Bapak Lurah yang selalu mendorong kami untuk mengirim proposal dan menghubungkan kami dengan pemangku kepentingan lainnya. Saat ini kami memiliki 23 anggota yang mengelola lebih dari 10 hektar lahan. Untuk menanam padi umur pendek dan komoditas polwija unggulan di wilayah pesisir, menggunakan pertanian adaptif iklim dengan menyeimbangkan antara menerapkan metode pertanian organik dan atau menerap atau menggunakan lebih sedikit bahan kimia. Praktek ini merupakan upaya untuk menjaga kesuburan tanah agar pada saat musim kemarau tanah masih memiliki nutrisi. Kami telah mengikuti 14 sesi pelatihan dan mendapat 9 program bantuan dengan nilai total 97 juta. Kami mengalokasikan 10 persen dana sosial di desa kami. Praktek kami mengundang kelompok tani perempuan lain di desa kami untuk melakukan kegiatan yang serupa dan meningkatkan organisasi mereka. Aksi-aksi kami dan dengan dukungan dari pihak terkait telah membuat perubahan besar dalam kehidupan kami secara pribadi. Memperkuat hubungan kami di masyarakat, meningkatkan pendapatan rumah tangga, dan meningkatkan ketahanan terhadap bencana. Kami ingin memperkuat organisasi kami dan terus terlibat dalam sisi pembangunan desa untuk memastikan bahwa aksi adaptasi perubahan iklim dan ketahanan diprioritaskan. Terima kasih atas waktunya. Mohon maaf apabila ada kata yang salah dan kurang berkenan. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Terima kasih Bu Warsila. So based on our experiences, shifting the power to local communities is not worthy. We can see how the local community, like women in rural and urban areas, which are most affected by climate change, is greatly important and experience immense change by managing the resources. Recognition of the local group is very full, helpful to give them confidence and allow them to access every support. Support that will strengthen their capacity to manage the
Thank, thank you, um, Ibu, Varsila, and Pa David for sharing your experiences. I think it was very exciting. Uh, while many of us have heard about Wairu Commission's Community Resilience Fund before, I think the example that you shared with us helped us really understand how this fund has been acting. Um, it's kind of key instrumental for triggering many actions around in the community, whether it's helping the communities to be better prepared or organize themselves to be real partners with local governments or helping the women in the communities to you know, establish collaboration with the agriculture extension workers and ultimately benefiting from government's uh, training, uh, training um, you know, modules. Um, I think it's very exciting that it's not just a one particular fund, but the overarching impact that the fund can have. And as Padre you said, really to shift the power within the local community where women are seen as agents of change by the local governments to drive the resilience agenda. It's a great example, so thanks for sharing with us, all of us, uh, really appreciate it. Um, in interest of time, uh, we will move ahead with the fourth presentation, which is from India, uh, looking at the Mahatma Gandhi Rural Employment Generation um, Act and the work they've been doing in Orissa. The presentation will be made jointly by Mr. Lambodar Kuntia, who's a block development officer from Shaharpara Block, and by Ms. Ranjan Mishra, the secretary for society for organization in various aspects. Hello, everyone. I am Lambodar Kuntia, block development officer of Sarpara Block in Kyungja district. I am extremely thankful to the organization to select the case study in the international conference. We are fortunate enough to have a support of uh, FCDO by which we enough to have the support of, uh, by we, we could dem demonstrate such a brilliant case which speaks about our local adoption to climate change. Now I request my colleague to present the case. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Hello, we can hear you. Uh, yeah. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Tular. Uh, I'm representing Suva. Uh, uh, I'm representing uh, Suva, uh, who is working uh, at the basic level. So, uh, so uh, today I'm going to speak about uh, MG, uh, MG Energies and uh, how, how it has impacted the lives of people through the help of ICRG. Next slide, please. So, uh, yeah, now Mahatma Gandhi National Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme, often uh, called as MG Energies. And it, it was passed by the government of India in 2005 with an aim to provide uh, livelihood securities to every household uh, whose uh, adult members volunteer to do unskilled manual uh, work at least for a period of 100 days. It is one of the largest public program, uh, 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 program in the world with an annual budget of uh, 13 billion US dollar. And it also covers districts of India except the one with 100% uh, urban population. So when we uh, speak, uh, speak about MG energies, uh, so I, I would like to recite one uh, uh, you know, saying of Mahatma Gandhi that India uh, lives in its villages. And it, yeah, of course, more than 65% of our population lives in the villages and most of the people are agrarian. So uh, most of the employees are landless and marginal farmers looking for livelihood opportunities. So, and uh, we all, we all have witnessed uh, the aftermath of COVID-19 and how it has, you know, drastically impacted the socioeconomic condition of the people. And uh, you, you can uh, see the map, uh, you, you can see the graph here that uh, it depicts as a strong administrative uh, structure from national village level based on bottom-up and participatory planning with social audits for down, uh, downward accountability. 
and all the government machineries you can see all the government machineries are involved in the success of schemes like central government state government then uh, district administration block administration panchayat village panchayat and of course the main stakeholders are the households and the house and in, in this particular uh, uh, situation the households of the uh, sahar pada block so till now this scheme uh, uh, has covered uh, more than 125 million household <coughs> sorry and 250 million people across rural india so next slide please <clears throat> yeah so uh, uh, infrastructure for climate uh, resilient growth that is icrg uh, is, uh, uh, it, it is a bilateral cooperation a program between the ministry of rural development that is mord government of india and the foreign commonwealth development office uh, that is fcdo with, with the aim to provide uh, or aim to improve the uptake of uh, service delivered by the mg energy scheme to systematically considering climate change in its planning and implementation and thus supporting uh, supporting resilience of groups of society that are most vulnerable to climate change and specifically it it, it, it aims to strengthen the quality and the productive productivity of infra, uh, infrastructure built under uh, mg energies to support a resilient uh, livelihood through ground uh, groundwater recharge and uh, like uh, you know micro irrigation soil and water conservation and plantation so icr rg plays a, a big role over here and it it, it, it also provide uh, technical assistance uh, to to the to the ministry of rural development the government of india and its three states basically in bihar chatisgarh and odisha so uh, next slide please yeah so this this uh, slide speak about the uh, using of uh, mg energies to support adaptation and moving beyond vulnerability threshold uh, in, in in odisha so how it has impacted the lives of people here so uh, the, uh, the, so climate risk management uh, is basically uh, integrated uh, in M uh, mg energies so it, uh, it is yielding uh, results uh, helping poor uh, uh, invest in climate resilient and livelihood strategies it, uh, it is also created a platform uh, by you know by way of shaping uh, shaping the barren land and provisioning uh, water uh, water bodies and uh, the next one is uh, it also help the community to engage in farming uh, farming or or farming related activities uh, throughout the year it is helping the people to earn more and creating employment opportunities you know it is also helping to stop the uh, uh, you know migration also at a certain extent <clears throat> so it has drastically changed the lives of people in saharpada through this uh, particular program and so many people have been benefited out of it uh, like you know uh, like cultivation of uh, potatoes and and also they have been you know uh, they have uh, they have been helped through this program by building different kinds of bunds and water shed water shed and water harvesting also everything has been uh, helped by uh, this particular mg and energies and icrg program so many sidal tribes community as uh, especially uh, the bondu community has been held i know uh, they have been their lives have been changed you can say at certain extent so next one please uh, yeah this is uh, uh, next slide please yeah so this uh, this slide uh, speaks about uh, the aligning with the eight lla principle and uh, initially we, we the you no know, we have been uh, told uh, regarding the eight lla principle how it has uh, helped the people and especially uh, uh, helped the people and it has been changing the lives of people uh, particularly and we have adopted five principles over here uh, yeah five principles uh, here in saharpada block 
like the first one is developing decision making to the lowest appropriate level and where what 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 we have done the community leaders participate in decision making uh, forums then we have actively engaged them in planning and monitoring as well as uh, uh, in adaptation of works in their local area then the second one is addressing uh, structural inequality uh, inequalities faced by women youth children disabled and uh, displaced and indigenous people and uh, marginalized ethnic groups yes and we have been helping the kondo community here uh, the, the the tribals we are helping here the specifically the gondo community the sts and we we are bringing them to the mainstream specifically to the women to the mainstream and uh, the third, fourth the, the fourth one is uh, investing in uh, local capabilities to lead an institutional agency the key strategy to develop of building uh, the lo the local capabilities to understand climate issues uh, plan and execute how we we are going to execute that and we have been executing uh, nicely over here in the other hand through direct support of icrg and the ground issues and initial challenges have been addressed all the whatever problem has been uh, faced by the people over here and it has been uh, addressed uh, by this program and spe specifically with the help of icrg and the initiative has already been institutionalized and owned by the administration and hence it is sustainable in long run yeah this program is sustainable in the long run and the fifth one is building a robust understanding of climate climate risk and uh, uncertainty group sensitized uh, sensitized uh, has been done through cso like suba we have been sensitized the people we have created awareness program we we have been trying them to bring them to the mainstream and so many people has been uh, come come to the mainstream and they have been uh, the, their lives have been changed to socially economically as well as climatically also i also speak about uh, in the next slide about the same thing the how the journey, this is the journey of the adapting uh, the next slide please a journey of the uh, yeah journey of the adapting uh, climate change impacts and in, <clears throat> so moving beyond uh, vulnerability threshold yeah, yeah this uh, slide specifically uh, speak about how we have uh, helped the, those people how we have changed their lives due to the successful implementation uh, of the scheme in saharpada block the lives of people has been immensely impacted uh, uh, in terms of socially economically and environmentally how economically they have been impacted due to the convergence with itda converted con uh, we have been you know converted uh, cultivable waste land to a productive uh, productive land with intensive integration of farm based livelihoods giving livelihood security to families directly and you know the the cropping area of the farmer has been uh, uh, you know uh, rose from 5 acre to 33 acres in kharif season and 5 acres to uh, 18 acres in rabi season here and their income has been also drastically increased here then how they have been uh, uh, helped to uh, socially so uh, what happened continuously uh, we have you know provided them a training support we have uh, we have been sensitized them through this uh, uh, the, you know they have been uh, you know the, they are enabled to take uh, take part in the decision making system and increased mobilization mobilization to public places such as engagement with stakeholders and all so the linkage with the various line departments uh, such as itda and oic enhanced the income of the farmers and helped them to think of livelihood opportunities through the year then how yeah and and also the district administration the block administration also they have been help uh, helping us uh, immensely at the grassroots level and the third one is the environmental impact how it has been impacted environmentally uh, so the heavy run of water and soil erosion uh, from upland to the uh, to the nala check so the direct run of rain water to the nala is uh, managed thus helping in uh, you know recharging of the ground water and it, it is, we have also done the soil quality and the moisture content of the soil is now enhanced 
over bond cultivation bond cultivation adopted by farmers led to strengthening of bonds so they have been immensely helped and finally the last one is institution strengthened to sustain the initiative by by the administration own guidelines to the scale of the initiative development so uh, they have been uh, helped they have been uh, impacted their income has been uh, uh, increased and you can say doubled also because they are earning uh, much more than before up, up, after the intervention i can say and uh, their li lives totally their their lives uh, is changing and it will be changed in in due course also and the same thing can be uh, we can also replicate in other parts of the state or or, or other part of the district as well so the, the last one is looking forward so uh, what what opportunities are uh, are lying ahead for the next three years the mg energies continue delivering climate resilient infrastructure across the cluster following icig integration uh, uh, approach with itda and oic then uh, we need to continue to strengthen the capacity of uh, implementing agencies who are implementing the project at the grassroots level on climate responsive planning and uh, planning and designing of assets then uh, the increasing the collaboration with other departmental schemes we can easily converge this scheme with other uh, departmental schemes especially forestry water resources agriculture and the rex uh, yeah the, the as i said earlier also it can be replicated across india the same because it is we have been seeing it and uh, in odisha also it is one of the best uh, case study which we can show to other uh, other people or other part of the country thank you so much and thank you so much for uh, hearing me and uh, giving me this opportunity if you have any question and uh, um, uh, i have mr uh, Navagan Oja, who can address all your queries. Thank you. Thank you so much, Thank you so much colleagues from India, for sharing this great example of a social protection program actually helping deliver on climate resilience following the principles of local adaptation. I think it's a great initiative, and many thanks to Government of India and FCDO for really demonstrating the opportunities that development programs can provide to deliver climate resilience when they are designed and implemented differently. And I think this is a question which goes back to in the chat about differentiating between climate and development. I think that kind of addresses these issues. Um, uh, we have a very short time, but I would like to just uh, briefly um, ask two questions, maybe to the four panelists, uh, perhaps either to Anandita or Tamara, if you're online. One question is about how in your each fund, uh, people with disability, how they have been participating and how are we making sure their concerns and needs are addressed? So either Anandita or Tamara, any one of you would like to answer that question? I, I could answer, this is Tamara. Thank so you. sorry, so sorry about that. Um, I, I, I'm gonna answer with with, with a lot of honesty. Um, we, we and, and I think it comes in the context of the region. Um, in, in Micronesia, um, you know, people with disabilities are, of course, part of communities, but, but this, this, there, there aren't a lot of organizations that specifically deal or, or are there to support people with, with disabilities. That, that area is growing. So for us at MCT, it's very hard for us to um, subgrant or, or, or fund um, projects coming from entities that support people with disabilities specifically because there aren't very many. So the best thing that we do are able to do is when we do our calls and when we advertise and when we go into communities and when we talk to people, we we prior we do make that a priority. Um, funding projects that support or are led by people with disabilities is a priority, uh, and we make that known. But to be honest, um, it it hasn't been something we've been able to do as much as we would like to. But I do believe that it is increasing as the context of the Pacific or of Micronesia um, um, increases. 
Thank you so much. Uh, if I have a kind of a follow up question to the speakers from India, colleagues there, you talked about the convergence. I think that's a very important point about how you know one program can benefit or actually plug in into other programs happening. Can you highlight to us some of the challenges that you might be uh, facing in to ensure convergence between these programs from a climate resilience angle? Any, any suggestions on that? Yeah, uh, so let me uh, answer this question. Uh, actually, this initiative which was presented today, uh, the impact is highly visible just because of the convergence initiative. Second, because the platform which was created only by the MBN, Mahatma Gandhi National Rural Grazing Scheme, and that platform actually invited the funds from different schemes and programs. Okay, so maybe ten percent of the funds have utilized from MBN here, and the rest eighty percent funds came from different schemes and programs. And that was the real challenge at the beginning of the program to bring the funds from different sources, and that is actually possible. Uh, because of the platform that was created. And this convergence helped the people engage around the year in, the, uh, in this initiative. Now, the biggest challenge before us is how to continue this, this, uh, this convergence initiative to sustain this initiative. At the, at the administration level, there is a policy decision, how to uh, bring this convergence uh, from different sources. But, at the same time, we are trying to make it, a, make it a larger policy, policy at a higher level, maybe at the state level or at the national level, so that the, the schemes which actually uh, invested these funds, they can continue investing these funds around the year, so that the people who are dependent on the infrastructure created by, by the ICRG program, their, their, their livelihood will, will be sustained. So this is a policy level decision which uh, the program is working closely with the administration and the policy makers. So which will be addressed very shortly. Thank you, Mohit, Mr. That was extremely useful. So thanks a lot, everybody. Maybe I'm just going to go for half a minute to other, to other any, any uh, burning um, responses which you would like to flag? Uh, hi, Argo. No, I think um, uh, what we discussed previous times still stays stable. We've had a few additional inputs, but what we're going to do in the interest of time is just package them in the post dialogue follow up that we do as opposed to um, sharing the screen now. Thank you, back to you. Thank you, Aditya. So I, I think the four examples were extremely um, insightful and rich and we clearly saw some common messages coming out of it. One was the issue of scale, whether we have the India program, which is scale in a geographical sense, or you have the Indonesia, the resilience fund, which is a very small in scale, but is able to actually leverage uh, wider impact through government's decentralization processes. So the issue of scale needs to be really understood differently because there, there are different um, you know, um, uh, objectives uh, what, of what we mean by scale. The second was the issue around decentralization, planning and budgeting and convergence, which is of course came out very strongly in both the Indonesia and the India example. And it's, it's very important if we are to achieve scale up of local adaptation. Third was the topics around looking at more um, emerging issues where the Bangladesh example of the climate induced migration was highlighted and how some of these um, innovative delivery mechanisms can really provide an opportunity to look at these issues. The fourth was around the financing modalities and within these delivery mechanisms also they're not homogeneous, they're quite diverse. And we talked about the Pacific one with combination of different kinds of funds coming together to promote different aspects of resilience building. And last but not the least is the looking at the importance of all these delivery mechanisms, really ensuring that the shift in power happens at the local level, where local communities are really seen as agents of change to deliver resilience um, objectives on grounds. So that was very exciting for me. Um, as a next step, of course, we would want all of you to participate in the next dialogue, which was, uh, is on 13th of October. And we promise you the next session will be more of a dialogue where we want to hear from you. Today was more of a case study examples, but we would like to hear from you as we move ahead in the next session, because ultimately, as you remembered, our objective is to see how we can establish a vision to deliver local adaptation at scale, how can we learn from each other, and how can we really inform and hopefully influence decision-making, specifically financial decision-making, whether it's a government, 
bilateral donors, multilateral development funds or climate funds to really put in money following the principles of local adaptation. So please do uh, let us through the Mentimeter slide, let us know if you're interested in participating in the dialogue in October, and we look forward to continuing this discussion. So many thanks all of you and have a good day. Thank you.